so would that t- have a tendency to draw other, like, more mischievous spirits to you? Or? Well, anytime, like I said, it's like it's like the subway analogy. If, you, if you're hanging out in the same place, you get to know the same things. All the people that you might run into aren't necessarily the people you want to talk to. We've all had that experience, <laughs> pretty <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, of course, like, anytime you do magic work, it, it attracts attention. But that's why it's just important to identify the spirit, confirm the spirit, get the spirit to give you some kind of sign, ask the spirit about things that it should know about if it is legitimately what it says it's going to be. And I usually throw in like a random question about just random stuff, like, you know, who's going to win the football game on a Sunday and blah, blah, blah. The spirit should know that if they really, this immense, powerful, out of time being that has access to all this information, they should be able to tell me the score at least. Like, that should be accurate. You know, like, th- th- like, these are all important to confirming, and you've got to... I mean, Crowley was relentless in his efforts to, like, uh, to confirm his stuff with spirits, to the point at which that he actually saw it as a detriment later. Like, when they were doing the Abel Dees working, uh, which produced book four at one point, the wizard Abel Dees contacted him through his girlfriend at the time, was like, okay, what you got to do is sell your shit. Go buy a villa in Italy, and I'll show you what villa to buy, and I'll show you what to do, and then you got to, like, get yourself set up here, and then you're going to write this book, and all this other stuff, and... Uh, he only got a certain way through the working because basically what he was saying was like he didn't he kept demanding the spirit to prove more and prove more and the spirit was getting pissed off with him because it's like I already proved myself to you and you're asking me to do this every time we talk and it's getting really annoying and then they kind of like had a blowout and it, it only went so far and Curly said later like you know really what I should have done was just shut up and gone with it because you know he had proved himself su- sufficiently but I mean his spirit was to be uh, oh, what it's confused in the context of using the word spirit here. His nature was to, you know, be very critical and be very and to always doubt what he was being told and demand absolute proof every time. Mm-hmm. And like that's really important to do. It's really easy to get, especially if you have like a limited success with initial workings, to just be like, okay, well I'm good with this. I'm just gonna run with what I'm getting told or whatever. And that's, that's never a good idea, really. Well, that's tempting me for certain of any experiences to like take everything. As well, the same thing so happened with Dean Kelly when they started having these <coughs> angelic workings, and the, the angels were like, "Okay, so you guys got to go to Prussia now." And Dean's kind of like, "I got shit to do. <laughs> I can't just pick up and move." And they're like, "Nah, it's time for you to leave." <laughs> and then he, again, he reflected on that later, saying, "Well, I should have just gone with it." But then again, you never know what you're supposed to just go with. It's always twenty-twenty hindsight. It goes back to what you were saying before about like identifying how do you know when it's really your holy guardian angel. It's like, well, it should be able to prove it to you beyond a doubt, but then what's beyond a doubt? It still seems weird. It's not faith if it's proven itself. Or trust. Yeah. Anything, even if it did prove itself. You know, it's like... You now, are there people you trust? What? Are there people you trust? Never completely. Okay. Well, then they. Well, you know, it's like people have power. They can do things. Doesn't necessarily mean they have to be your best or trust the power. That's true. And that's an interesting question when it comes to anything with magic. I mean, one of my friends, particularly talking with the Goetia, said, you know, ideally you wouldn't do this with someone who you wouldn't trust with your life. So, and not necessarily to say that it's life or death to do goetic magic. It's certainly not. I've never known anyone to be carried off by evil spirits. It's, as far as I know, it never happened. But, um, yeah, I mean, you have to have that level of confidence in what the other person is doing and the sort of unity of intent, at least. And that's the same thing with the guardian angel. I mean, there's a reason that uh, Crowley frequently makes reference to uh, a submissive sexual act when he is talking about his relationship with his angel. I mean, that he considers those to be identical, essentially. And that comes up frequently in the holy books. I guess that's a big part of the reason, like, the Golden Dawn structure sort of emphasizes basically making the magical weapons before you get to the point of the Holy Guardian Angel invocation yeah. in the first place. So, like, for instance, um, the sword is sort of your intellect and your ability to discern things. So that would sort of, you know, come in handy when you're trying to decide if you can trust, you Yeah, know. you got to have a good sharp sword. <laughs> so that's, you know, doing that kind of work to build that those aspects of your own mind would sort of mean that you're not necessarily going to trust every little, you know, spiritual interaction and that sort of thing. So you develop the ability to avoid, you know. <laughs> I, know I think of Cartesian philosophy a lot when I think of, of this whole issue where he talks about, like Descartes had, when he's talking about um, the question of existence. Because like, he's famous for, I think, therefore I am. Or, well, we've all heard this one. But it, there's one point where he's kind of like, all right, maybe I can doubt my existence. Maybe nothing is real. 
And it's kind of like the matrix theory of philosophy. Like, okay, maybe this is all this an illusion, and there's a terrible demon who has me in a little box, and I don't know what's really happening around me, and it's all fake. But it's like, well, even if that was the case, I kind of still have to behave as though this was my reality because it's not rational to behave in any other way. Even if it's all a lie, even if it's all an illusion, even if none of this is real, even if I don't really exist, I might as well behave as though I do. <laughs> because Until you find a way out of it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that it comes down with that, to that with the Holy Guardian Angel. To a certain degree, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's completely trust, but the question is, if this entity is competent to give you advice that actually takes you in a direction that you can see, and you can see real results, and you get the experience, even when it's a conflicting experience, even when it's telling you things you don't want to hear, you know, there's times that people tell you things you don't want to hear, and there's times that you know that they're full of shit. Like if someone is like talking shit to you or whatever, and whatever, they're insulting you maybe, and they say something you know is not true, so it doesn't bother you. But then there are other times that they say something and it's like, Maybe even if it comes from your worst enemy, a shitty person who you really hate and you think they're an idiot and a moron, but sometimes they say things and you know that it's true. And that's when it actually strikes a chord. I mean, I do think that we do know the difference between truth and lies instinctively in a certain degree, especially when it comes to stuff about ourselves. And the angel is capable of telling you the things about yourself that you maybe wish weren't true, but actually are. And that's kind of how you identify them. Because demons don't do that. like, And hostile spirits don't do that. They flatter people. They... Th th that's the, the major tendency of any like of these entities that are trying to get into your head or trying to get with you or like connect with you or whatever that maybe you don't want to actually deal with. Part of the way that you identify them is that they're constantly flattering you, telling you how great you are, telling you what you want to hear, uh, and that's not useful information. I'm great is not something that I need to hear from uh, a spirit across the void or from another dimension or whatever. Like you know, I can tell myself I'm great and that's fine. <laughs> I'm perfectly comfortable with doing that. How we do. <laughs> so if you don't have any other questions, I'm pretty much done. How do you define sort of the intent of using the word supernatural? Like um, what you're trying to achieve, do you write it down? Do you actually I, of I would I would do both. Um, I tend to when I'm starting working just deliver a very specific statement of intent. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to do. Like in a thelemic context especially, because we're supposed to be guided by true will or whatever. Um, but yeah, like it's really important to like say explicitly, this is why I'm doing this, I expect to get this result. And if you're looking for like more concrete things, uh, it's good to have a timeline of some kind. Because it's really, it can be vague if you don't know exactly what time frame things are gonna happen along. You know, you can just say, okay, well something good happened, you know, two weeks later, well, maybe something good was gonna happen anyway and it has nothing to do with the ritual, you know? So it, it, Any, whatever you can do to make it as measurable as possible is really important. And so you can use it to, you're, you're basically asserting your dominance over all that. Yeah. That's what the ritual is for. Over matter, motion, all spiritual okay. energies. So you can put an intent into that to manifest something. Yes. That's basically the concept. Yeah, absolutely. And um, sometimes the statement of intent would come before, and sometimes it would come after, depending on what you're doing. Like if you're using the preliminary invocation for the Goetia, I'll do the Bornless Ritual first, and then the Statement of Intent when you have the authority. Um, then if you're doing the Bornless Ritual in itself to like manifest, for example... Oh, so as long as it makes common sense. Yes, yeah. Okay. But it's really, it is really important to state very clearly, like, I am doing this for this reason, this is why I'm doing this. Like, should you do the intent in positive present tense form? Like, you know, there's all these little rules. In what form? In, like, uh, saying it, um, like, it's happening already to you, and it's not using words like don't. Mm. Does that matter? I, I, I wouldn't say it matters too much. Um, you know, and if you want to be specific, be specific. Like when you're doing the Goetia, uh, in in the conjurations, it kind of says, you know, appear in a fair human shape, and it kind of gives it the spirit certain restrictions, and the license to depart is very specific. You know, like go, like come when I call, always come as a friend, and so on and so forth. Like, so yeah, I mean, if there's something that you specifically don't, want, it's important to not to have a negative intent. I mean. Uh, there's a really great book uh, by one of Freud's students, uh, Eric Fromm, called Escape from Freedom, where he talks about you know, sort of the nature of freedom and how our society is set up to actually make us sort of afraid of freedom, in a sense. We want certain restrictions. Um, and one of the things he says when you ask people to define freedom, they usually talk about the things that they don't want to have happen to them, or restrictions that they don't want to have placed on them. And it's all, it's all don'ts. It's all negative. It's like, 
You know, they, as Fromm puts it, ironically, they can only conceive of freedom from and never freedom to. And his kind of thing is it's important to know what we are free to do, not what we are free from. And we have a society where we're free from traditional restrictions, traditional forms of tyranny uh, that you would see in historically speaking. But what we're free to do is actually very little. Like we're free to make consumer choices. We're free to, you know, that, and like as far as like, as far, as far as actual change or like freedom to create something, well, we, we have very limited freedom in that respect. Um, so could you use it to, uh, putting aside Right. Could you use it to throw a hat so it hurts? Oh, absolutely. It's yeah, very effective that way. So there isn't some sort of little thing. Hey, if you're Lord of the Universe, you're Lord of the Universe. You can curse whoever the hell you want. Yeah. So you can just change this up like day by day, like um, have a different intent one day? Or, like, oh, yes, yes. Okay, so it is a standard. It is, in many ways, like the reason that Hurley uses it so ex exclusively or extensively, pardon me, wrong word, is. Um, that it does have this sort of very general sense of, I am now in charge. And when you're in charge, you get to make the decisions, and then that's when you decide what to do, basically. So it is useful in that respect. I don't know. I, I think that there is an, a very amoral quality to the whole thing to begin with. Like, just the idea of asserting yourself in this way is necessarily immoral. And Crowley's very clear as his take on morality. It's, there's the morals of Lieber Al, which, you know, if you read the book, it's pretty, pretty direct, it's pretty violent, it's pretty aggressive. It's certainly not like live and let live, and certainly not turn the other cheek. Like, those concepts are not part of Thelema. I think if you decided to commit yourself to becoming Lord of the Universe, you no longer have the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the easy stance of knowing what's right and what's wrong anymore. And, and, yeah, you, you know. decide what's right and what's wrong at that point. Yeah. And that's very threatening for certain people. I mean, that's the whole point of Fromm's book, is like, we are actually far more comfortable. And that's where it says in Liberal, you know, the kings of the earth will be kings forever, and the slaves shall serve. Slavery is part of Thelema. Thelema? 